This Ridley Report is brought to you by Libertania.com. Libertania, the liberation of conformia, is a children's book that makes freedom fun. Although, I guess it's already fun. Buy it on Amazon, get it in print, or use it on Kindle. Teaching without preaching, the ideals of freedom to the most important people in your life. Libertania.com Basically, if you put a pigeon in a box with a button and link the button to a food source, if you make it so that the button, every time the pigeon pushes the button, food comes out, then the pigeon will wait until it's hungry, push the button, and food comes out. If you delay the food, right, so every third time the pigeon pu pushes the button, food comes out. Well, then the pigeon will learn the relationship. Three button pushes means food. And it will wait until it's hungry and then push the button three times and then get food. If you want the pigeon to continuously push the button always and everywhere, you would randomize the relationship between the number of button pushes and the delivery of food. Sometimes it comes out on five, sometimes it comes out on three, sometimes it comes out on two, and the pigeon sits there and does nothing all day but pecks the button so as to assure that it will always have food when it wants some. Much the same was recognized as a potential for not only maintaining social order within the prison community environment in Bentham's designs, but also for promoting social order in society at large. The belief was that individual people out there in the social world, we, we're all different. We all face different costs and benefits. A lot of the classical school economists recognize this about crime and punishment. They recognize that a punishment for a poor person might have a very different deterrent effect compared to a punishment for a wealthy person. And what was all the more important was that if you get that ratio incorrect, you can end up um, promoting or encouraging people to commit very serious forms of crime. In other words, uh, Bentham again coined what's called the third law of demand almost 200 years before UCLA economists came up with it, Alchin and Allen, uh, in the 1970s. The third law of demand explains why it is that boring married people with children tend to go to the opera more than they tend to go to the movies. Uh, single people who don't have children, who don't have to spend a transaction cost of babysitting services, they tend to um, go out regularly and frequently. So they're giving up lots of units of going to the movies, a relatively cheap form of entertainment, for one uh, instance of going to the opera. Whereas if you have to bear that fixed cost on either transaction, you tend to opt towards a higher valued good. So in the context of crime and punishment, if we don't differentiate the punishment that's associated with a menial crime compared to a severe crime, if criminals gain value from exploiting wealth from their victims, right? If I steal $5,000 from you and there's no different penalty compared to stealing $50,000 from you, then I as the criminal should do everything I can to maximize what it is that I take from you if I'm already committed to, to, to break the law. And so, again, it w this is sort of the second component. Not only are you constantly observing criminal behavior, but you're also refining the amount of time that you spend incarcerated as a proportioned mechanism to the severity of the crime. So we got a calculation device in the, the prison system. It was believed to resolve the ambiguities of calculation, etc. cetera, uh, which is sort of familiar territory for Austrian economists when, when we talk about the pricing mechanism. Uh, it's very difficult to come up with capital good prices if you don't have consumer good markets and vice versa. Um, so. After Bentham's design, uh, a, a few facilities around the developed world at the time really experimented with this new form of criminal punishment. Before this, um, earlier periods of, of both England and Scotland, a lot of the Anglo-Saxon world, as well as dating back earliest into the ancient world, there were no such things as criminal justice systems in the way in which we think of them today. Um, in this vein, a lot of what my research has, has uh, argued is that the rise of incarceration, the rise of a uh, state-sponsored criminal justice system is in part uh, coeval or um, complementary in, in, in historical development with the rise of a conventional form of a nation state, a large federal government. Um, they really define their existence by means of their ability to control and manipulate law enforcement. 
And so in the late 18th century in the Anglo-Saxon experience, you see this massive transition from things that look like something Murray Rothbard would have written about or look like something like a private legal system. In other words, what we call today the civil legal process where people sue one another, that same general structure of um, complaint, of prosecution, of defendants, civil liability between equal individuals, that was used to resolve matters of violence, fraud, theft, etc. Um, until you had this invention, this sort of technique of uh, universalizing criminal punishments, um, you didn't necessarily have a completely distinctive criminal legal system apart from torts, uh, lawsuits, etc. <laughs> Libertania.